Reformed Church. We're very glad that you're here with us. This is, uh, I see some things are missing. We're thankful for the people that uh, helped take down the Christmas decorations. We'll miss them until next year, but uh, we continue on our journey here. And I'm excited to tell you that we have uh, the beginning of a series starting today. It's called, I Still Believe, Faith in Times of Trial. I Still Believe, Faith in Times from Trial. We're going to hear from uh, multiple passages in the Bible for the next five weeks of uh, stories of real faith, of uh, continuing to trust in God even when it didn't seem to make sense and how that uh, applies to our lives. So we're excited to share that with you this morning. I'd like to direct your attention to some announcements in the bulletin. We continue to encourage you to sign up for fellowship hours, bring some treats and some uh, for flowers as well. We have a new newsletter. Uh, it's on the, the print version is on the back table. We'll be getting the electronic version to you later today or sometime this week. But a uh, good uh, edition of the newsletter on the back table. Also on the back table with this series, I encourage you to take notes. There's a little space on the back of this blue insert. There's also uh, some extra paper there. It's the sermon notes on that table as well. Other announcements that we'd like to share today. <clears throat> Our annual congregational meeting is coming up January 27th. I encourage you to be there for that. We have uh, an important uh, consistory meeting tomorrow night. We encourage prayer for that. Um, we have Ignite Youth Fellowship tonight, 6 o'clock at the Parsonage. And uh, normally the Man Up Men's Fellowship gathering is on Saturday morning, but this time we're doing it on Friday night. We're going to watch a movie. It's called Facing the Giants. It's a very good movie. It's a movie produced by Christians, and it's got a great message, and that's not just for men, if you want to bring your sons, your daughters, uh, but if you haven't come out to Man Up before, it's a great time to get to know some of the guys a little better, to watch the movie, we'll get some pizza, but uh, great message, great movie, I've seen it multiple times, and uh, very uplifting, and it's about football, the playoffs going on, great timing for that, so please join us. Any other announcements? That's next Friday night, 6.30 in the Clemens Room. Okay, let's start with some prayer. I'm sorry, I, I walked all over that. We'll still pray. Father, thank you so much for this uh, time, this <coughs> gathering, this place. And uh, we ask you to be with us. We ask you to, through your Holy Spirit, inspire, lift our worship this morning. Amen. All right.
worship. It's, uh, it comes from Psalm 143. <coughs> Found in your bulletin. I'll begin. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come and relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. Yeah. Makes me dwell in darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me, my heart within me is dismayed. See, I remember the days of long ago, and I meditate on all your works, and I consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you, I thirst for you like a crushed land. Answer me quickly, Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Show me the way I should go, for you and you I can trust my life. Amen. We don't have a thousand tongues here, but we'll make it sound like it. Over a thousand tongues to sing. Number 21. In the red hymnal. Thank you. 
words of assurance, this assurance of forgiveness together. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for redeeming my life from the pit. Amen. A couple of weeks ago we talked about being people who are redeemed, a gathering of people who are redeemed. From what? From hell, from our sins, from, from many things in life. It's a part of our joy that we are redeemed, saved. I'd like to invite the children forward for the message. Thank you. 
about faith, we're talking about assurance. Let's uh, sing of this assurance, number 572, Blessed Assurance. So that the king might suffer no loss, 
Soon Daniel distinguished himself above all the other presidents and satraps because of an excellent spirit that was in him. And the king planned to appoint him over the whole kingdom. So the presidents and the satraps tried to find grounds to complain against Daniel in connection with the kingdom. But they could not find any complaints or any corruption because he was faithful. And no negligence or corruption could be found in him. The men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So the presidents and satraps conspired and came to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom and the prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king you should establish an ordinance and enforce an interdict that whoever prays to anyone divine or human, for thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown in a den of lions. Now, O king, establish this law and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the law. Although Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he continued to go to his house, which had windows in its upper room, open toward Jerusalem. And get, he would get down on his knees three times a day to pray to his God and praise him, just as he had done previously. The conspirators came and found Daniel praying and seeking mercy before his God. Then they approached the king and said, concerning the law, O king, did you not sign an interdict that anyone who prays to anyone divine or human within thirty days except to you, O king, shall be thrown in the den of lions? The king answered, Yes, the thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they responded to the king, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, and to the law you have signed. But he's saying his prayers three times a day. When the king heard this charge, he was very much distressed. He was determined to save Daniel, and until the sun went down, made every effort to rescue him. Then the conspirators came to the king and said to him, No, O king, it is the law of the Midians and Persians that no law ordinance that the king established can be changed. Then the king gave the command, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, the signet of the Lord's, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No food was brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Ready? Here it is. <clears throat> then, at the break of day, the king got up and hurried to the den of lions. And when he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously, Daniel? O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you faithfully serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel then said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no wrong. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. No kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The king gave command. And those who had accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. Before they reached the bottom of the den of the lions, overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples and nations in every language throughout the whole world, May you have abundant prosperity. I make a decree that in my, all, in my royal dominion people should tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. Enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. For he saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A little long, but great story, great drama. If I said to you, that's 
anyone here, especially you know here in Bergen County, has anyone here ever been in a den of lions? We would all say no. We have not been in a den of lions. Maybe you went to the Bronx Zoo. Maybe you went to the Philadelphia Zoo or the Central Park Zoo. At some point, you've seen the lions, but thankfully, you have not gone into the den of the lions or been thrown into a den of lions. All true. But what I would say to you is, you have been there. You have been there. There weren't lions, and it wasn't a den of lions and stone and things like that. But you have been there. You've been there when you've lost loved ones. You've been there when your job was on the line, and ultimately maybe you lost your job. You've been there during times when maybe your marriage was going through a very rocky time and you weren't sure whether or not it was going to make it. You've been there in times where it just felt like it was darkness, and you couldn't find God. The den of lions in the story is a real thing. It was a place of, it was a place of punishment and a place of, of uh, penalty. But in this case, for our teaching today, the den of lions is that place of no hope. Is that place where, of place of surrender. It's a place where there's nothing else to do. There's nothing else left but to trust in God. When I say den of lions, and when I describe some of those places that I think represent a den of lions in, in our own time, in our place, you're thinking, I don't want to be there. I've been there. I don't want to go back there. But I want you to watch today. We've heard the story. I just want to go through it a little bit. I want you to watch how, with faith, in the time of trial, we see that those places can become places of miracles. I want you to watch. One of the interesting things that we see in this scripture that, uh, that we're, I think we're always um, interested to see is that whether this is thousands of years ago or today, human nature does not change. Daniel, he's doing a great job. What happens? His colleagues get jealous of him. This happens at your work. This happens everywhere. And so they say, listen, this guy Daniel, and also let's keep in mind who Daniel is. Here, they're in the, uh, under the, the reign and kingdom of uh, Darius, and this is when the, the Israelites of, and the Jewish people have been exiled. So Daniel is an outsider by all standards, and yet he keeps getting promoted, and uh, King Darius is a big fan of his, and like I said, they, you know, these people get together and say, this guy, Daniel, why is he getting promoted? He doesn't even belong here. So Daniel gets promoted, and then of course they concoct their, their uh, scheme against him, and of course, uh, a couple of months ago, we were using as our praise song in Christ Alone. It says, no, uh, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. That's what, this, that's what this reveals as well. So they put together this plan, and they knew it. And this is one of the things that I think is helpful for us to see in this passage. Daniel's faith is not private. It's visible. These guys recognize it. They say, we know how to get him. He's going to keep praying, even though Darius makes this law. He's going to keep praying. Then we're going to get him. Can you imagine, you know, just <laughs> there's something so disturbing about trapping faithful people. It's disturbing. But anyway, we continue. They catch him, and then they go, and they go, oh, king, didn't you sign this letter? Didn't you, didn't you sign this rule? He goes, of course I did. They say, oh, well, sorry. Your buddy Daniel, he's not listening to it. And you hear that the king is in strife over it. He's thinking, how can I get my buddy Daniel out of this? And then, of course, he couldn't because it had been signed. And so it goes to the den of the lions. And you know the rest of the story. He's there in the morning. And uh, I want to show you three things that Daniel's Faith teaches us 
three C's, make it uh, easy this morning, three C's that Daniel's faith teaches us. The first one is commitment. Now remember, this is in a time of trial. Like I've said many times before, we sit here on a Sunday morning. We have trials going on in our lives. We face challenges here at church, as a church. But for the most part, we're safe here. Sunday morning is mostly a happy, good time. Daniel's in the lion's den. This is a time of challenge. It's a time when you lean on your faith. This is why we want to pay attention to these stories. They really teach us. And we'll face those times. First thing Daniel teaches us is commitment. Daniel's commitment to God is visible. His enemies understand it. The king understands it. And he uses it to strengthen. He makes a commitment to God, no matter where he is, whether he's not in Israel, not in Judah, wherever country he is, it doesn't change. Whatever the circumstances are, it doesn't change. He's still going to be praying, as the custom was, three times a day, with the windows open, so that everybody can see. That's powerful. Commitment. Sometimes we think of church today, we think of our own lives, and we think, well, I've got this commitment, I've got that commitment, I've got that commitment. Or, because of trying to please others, or other challenges that we face, we think, well, maybe I'll ease up on the religion today, maybe I'll ease up on the Jesus stuff today, because I don't want to offend anybody. Daniel says, no, I'm fully committed, 100% in this. The number one thing in Daniel's life was God. Yes, he had a great job. He's doing well. But his number one thing, absolutely, unswerving, unashamedly committed to God. That's the first thing we want to know about Daniel's faith, but also when we're in a time of trial. We don't back off the commitment, as we'll be tempted to do. Listen, Daniel could have easily said, well, these guys are, uh, these guys are going to try and squeeze me, so Maybe I'll pull the shades down on the windows here, so to speak. Or maybe I'll say, you know, I'll pray in secret. Scripture says Daniel was aware of this. He's still going to pray. So one of the things we want to take away from that is, when we're in a time of trial, when we get some bad health news, when we get financial news, we're tempted to say, well, you know, I'm not going to give so much because I've got to dial that down. Or, uh, you know, I'm just really disappointed in this news. So I'm not going to pray as much because where's God in all of this? See, from the, what this passage reveals today is no. Turn it up. Dial up the commitment. Watch what happens. First thing Daniel teaches us is commitment to God. That's what's going to get us through a time of trial. Number two. Not as, not as fun. Not as powerful but still real and still something to think about. The second C is cost. Faith in times of trial, faith in general, but more intensified in time of trial, is going to cost us. It cost Daniel nearly his life. Faith in times of trial <coughs> is going to cost us. Now, he's punished for wrong reasons. He's punished and sent to the den of lions. Sometimes it's going to cost us when we believe in a time of trial. It might cost us relationships. It might cost us long-time friends. It might cost us peace, at least temporarily. But it's going to cost real faith, true faith, refined faith from the fire. It's going to cost. We say that this morning not only because it's true, but we say that as preparation, as as a, a way to remind us that if we're going to lean on God in this world, it's going to cost. Jesus talked about this as well. <clears throat> he said, to follow me, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you your life. But there's something you're going to get for this. And certainly Daniel, who's willing to pay the cost, gets something out of it when we follow Jesus as disciples. We get new life. What else is better? What else is better? So there's going to be a cost. We think of saints throughout the history, whether martyrs who went into lion's dens and died, or people who have lost jobs because of their faith, or left jobs because of their faith and their morals. <clears throat> That's powerful. The cost. Finally, command. 
Faith in times of trial, as revealed by Daniel's story, is about commitment, it's about paying the cost, and it paying off, and it's about surrendering command. Think about this, when Daniel, he's thought about it, he's going to pay the cost, he's going into the lion's den. I want you to think about it for a minute. Like I said, you've been there. I want you to go back there this morning, or visit, so to speak, with Daniel. You're put in the lion's den. They roll the stone over. And you sit there and face death. The lions can easily tear you apart, a very violent death. And he sits there and faces that. Like I said before, the one thing that he has, and it's not just a last resort, and it's not just a, a lifesaver, he's got his trust in God. In other words, he's fully surrendered. He's given command of his life over to God. You could say, well, maybe he didn't have a choice. Maybe. But I think long before this point, Daniel had surrendered his life to God. And a life fully surrendered to God. I know it hits our egos and we think, but what about me? And what about this? And a life fully surrendered to God the only life worth living. A life fully surrendered when God is in command. When we grow into that. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. I told you this before. Less Chris, for me, less Chris, more Christ. Same for the rest of us. Daniel surrenders his life. You know what it looks like? You know what the process is? It's, it's Daniel choosing God's glory over himself. God's glory became more important. At some point there was this line that Daniel crossed and began to live his life like this. And that line is waiting for us too. Maybe you're there, maybe you're moving towards it. But at some point in our maturation process as Christians, there's a line where God's glory pleasing Christ becomes more important than any desires or dreams or goals of ours. That's a life fully surrendered. Jesus talked about when you lose your life for the sake of the gospel, you gain it. You gain life in me. And that's, that's a lot of our battles today. That's a lot of our strife and our conflict. That we're, we're so busy trying to accomplish and trying to do stuff based on our skills, our gifts, alone. And meanwhile, God is saying, let me command this ship. Let me command your life. Surrender to me. I hope you noticed in this story, speaking of full surrender, there were echoes of Christ and his death and his burial. They put Daniel in the lion's den. What do they do? Roll a stone over. They put Jesus in the grave. They roll the stone over. Both the grave for Jesus, hopeless. The disciples are thinking, ready? It's over, right? Darius, King Darius is thinking, it's over for Daniel. This is the best part. When we're committed, when we're aware of the cost, when we're willing to pay that cost, and when we fully surrendered and said, Lord, into your hands, I put my life. Then the miracles start happening. Jesus is raised from the dead. <laughs> Daniel comes out of a lion's den alive. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I can't guarantee you that you and I will see miracles like that in our times of trial. I can't guarantee you that magnitude of miracles. I can promise you that you will see God move in powerful ways when we're committed, when we're mindful of the cost, and basically saying, yes, I'm willing to pay this cost, and when <clears throat> we understand that we're surrendering our lives to God. And that, when that part of our self is pushed away, we choose to live surrendered to God in command. That's when you're going to see miracles. That's where you're going to see power. That's where many of you have seen that already. I look around this room, I've seen stories very much like this. Okay, 
they were in a lion's den, literally. I've seen it in my own life. I've been in some lion's dens, and every time, as here I am breathing, God's pulled me out. It's a beautiful thing. There's one more part, right? Daniel gets out of the lion's den. What happens? There's another aspect of this. King Darius basically becomes a follower of God. He says, Daniel's God is the living God. He saves, he rescues, and in all my dominion, I want you to believe in this God. Can you imagine this? This is unbelievable. That this King Darius, who knew not of God only through Daniel, becomes a believer and a witness and basically an apostle. That's the gift we can give to other people when we keep our faith in times of trial. Other people see it. Daniel, throughout the whole passage, is witnessing to everybody and giving them encouragement but, and, and opposing him as well. But then he comes out of the lion's den. Jesus comes back from the grave. And this whole world is different because of that. You and I, when we face times of trial, when we're in the lion's den, and God lets us out in one way or another, people are going to see that and be encouraged and strengthened. This is what can be accomplished when we say, I still believe in a time of trial. Amen. Let's pray. Father, many of us, if not all of us in some respect, are in a time of trial. Sometimes it's at work. Sometimes it's in a relationship. Sometimes it's as parents. Sometimes it's with health diagnoses of different kinds. And we're scared. And we're crying out to you. But we're holding on to you. We pray for the commitment. We pray for the mindfulness of the cost. And we pray that you'll take command. That we surrender to your power, your strength, your everything. And then we can say with confidence, and assurance, and with expectation that the lions aren't going to touch us, that the enemies aren't going to prosper, that the disease isn't going to succeed, that all the darkness and, and wickedness in this world will not have the last word. Oh, yes, we thank you, Lord, this morning for this faith, this gift that can transform not only our lives, not only our circumstances, to people, co-workers, neighbors, friends, family members who are watching. Amen. Amen. Faith in times of trial, we still believe. I encourage you this morning. Hang in there. Endure. We come back next <coughs> week and we'll see some more uh, passages and stories of uh, this kind of strength it's available to every person in this room, everyone watching. Take time in our worship to give thanks for this great gift of faith that comes to us. If you're sitting here thinking, Mom, I just gotta get some more faith. Faith is received. Faith is received. Don't try to, try to gin it up. Let God pour it out into your life abundantly. You just need to receive it. Take time to give back after we've given, we've received this great gift want to give back to God. Part of it is a cost, whether it's worshiping here, whether it's serving, and yes, whether it's putting our, our money under the command of God as well. Let's receive those tithes and offerings. The deficit that we run, and uh, we closed a number of gaps, and I thank you, but I give God the credit, but uh, I, give you, I give you thanks for responding. Not only for your commitment to this church, but it signifies your commitment to God and your trust in Him. He will continue to provide for you as uh, provide for us as we give. So we celebrate that. Uh, we still have challenges ahead. Still have uh, work to do. But very pleased, very blessed, and uh, I wanted to give you that <coughs> word of encouragement. I just want to uh, take time for for prayer.
Father, one of the things we love about you, one of the things we adore about you, and we're thankful is all these prayers and, and joys and concerns that we've lifted up, you already know. You're already working on them. But you love that we come to you, that we put our trust in you, that we surrender these circumstances to your power. And we do that with confidence, and we do that with expectation. So Lord, we do lift up many people. We're lifting up Donald, who's not feeling well. We're lifting up Donna, who needs our prayers, and uh, we pray about the results of her test. Thinking of Rachel, thinking of Jessica, thinking of uh, Alan, thinking of many people in this room who faced trials this week, and you sustained them, and you will continue to sustain them, whether they're health or otherwise. We're thinking of Drita facing a challenge tomorrow. We're thinking of Katie and her travels and her new semester. Lord, I think of young people in general in this room who, who face trials every day and temptations. Pray that you give them strength. Remind them. Make it visible to them that you're with them. You're very present. Lord, we're thinking of people in this room who are facing financial trials whether it's uh, because of fixed income or uh, older age or reduction in hours and work, we pray, we pray for strength and patience. Lord, all of this requires patience. You know that, and, and somehow that's the thing we seem always to lack. So we're praying that you'll give us that patience. You'll, you'll bless us with that patience. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the faithfulness that we've seen here. And thank, thank you for the hope and the, the increasing commitment we see here and the passion we see here for you. We pray that your Holy Spirit continues to inflame that. And we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Yes. We're praying with power. We're praying with confidence. Not because of anything that anything to do with us, because the one we pray to is our is our leader and our our Lord. We close our worship with uh, number. <clears throat> Number 583, were by all in all, and he is.
is the name above all names. He is the power in our prayer. He is a salvation. We send you forth in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.